building a mass spec from scratch that can compete with these companies. It's it's almost it's like uh, trying to move move a mountain. Welcome to Tough Tech Today with Mayan and Miller. This is the premier show featuring trailblazers who are building technologies today to solve tomorrow's toughest challenges. Welcome to Tough Tech Today. Uh, we have with us Maz, who is the Chief Executive Officer, Chief Technology Officer, and founder of Trace Matters, which is a fascinating company that's working on the next generation of mass spectrometry technologies. And so, Maz, we're going to need you to help explain to us what all that is. And you have a lot of hats that you're wearing for this company. Basically, I, I think the best best um, start point is just to talk about what a mass spectrometer is. Probably, I think you've heard in, in Big Bang Theory that when they want to talk about a very complex instrument, they say that, oh, we're working on this mass spectrometer. But it's really, it's not that complex. It's basically you need just high school physics to understand what the mass spec is. So probably, again, everything high school, uh, probably from high school chemistry, you remember that we have molecules. And those molecules, they have protons and electrons and neutrons. And we have a nucleus, which most of the mass of an atom or a molecule is in the nucleus. And that stays constant. For example, for water, we have one oxygen, and two hydrogen, so 16 plus one plus one, it's 18. So the atomic, the, the molecular mass of uh, water molecule is 18. So if somehow you're, you'd be able to measure that, that mass, then you can, you can basically very accurately identify molecules. Mm -hmm. And obviously water is the, is the simplest, simplest molecule. This can go up to proteins and even like people have, have um, measured the, the mass to charge ratio of uh, viruses and bacteria, bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, the way it works is that you take a molecule, either you take one electron out or you charge it with one electron so that you, you can produce a, ch produce a charged molecule. Mm -hmm. And that charged molecule, um, again, in high school, back in high school physics, if you have an electric field and the charged particle is moving in that electric field, then the the trajectory is going to be dependent on the mass to charge ratio and that's what it's the like, mass like is the right hand rule right with like gravity exactly you know so we have like we can use magnetic and also electric force uh, and electric fields and uh, with both of them they're they're different mass spec uh, technologies that either use mm -hmm. magnetic or electrical um, fields to to be able to separate the this ions based on mass to charge ratio and it's kind of probably it's a good analogy to say that it's kind of similar to a prism that when you have a like a, a light white light a prism separates the the uh, basically the light bit according to the wavelength mm -hmm. so a mass spec is the same um, thing for ions that separates ions based on mass to charge ratio. With this kind of uh, like foundational science, that if you can do this kind of assessment, then what are all that kind of applications that this could go to? Who would really benefit from being able to do this kind of analysis? Well, that's that's a very interesting question. Um, mass spectrometry. Probably, it's a good idea to. Um, a little bit talk about the history of the mass spectrometry that actually the mass, first mass spectrometer was used in the discovery of protons so throughout the history like uh, people have received five Nobel prizes for mass spec and the applications are expanding but for example the most important application which i think it's it's kind of uh, relevant to your podcast is space and medical applications which at trace matters we are we are focused on both for example, in the space application, um, you, probably Forrest knows this better than me, that in every space mission, um, there is a mass spec. If they're, they're trying to look at the, the composition of the, these um, uh, outer planets, even if it's landed or it's a flyby, somehow you need a mass spec to, to, to basically see the, the chemistry in, in a space. And, um, in the medical field, 
probably it's closer to you than you can think. But if you go take a blood test, the vitamin D of your blood is measured with a mass spec. Or if um, there's this program called newborn screening, which when a, a baby is born, um, they take um, a small um, drop of blood, they put it on a paper and they let it dry. Then they send it to state labs to to just screen the blood for probably 10 to, 10 to 20 amino acids, which based on that, they can they can correlate that, the lack of amino acids to, to, to potential sicknesses. And if they can, they can identify that early, they can put the baby on the supplement to prevent that disease. And these, um, this newborn screening, it's a, it's a very like um, big program that every day, probably in US, every month, millions of tests are, 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 are uh, being conducted for, for this with, with mass specs. If this, uh, if mass spectrometers have been, I mean, we've already got, you know, five Nobel laureates for it. So it's been around for, for at, le at least probably decades, right? Many decades. And, and if it's so widely deployed, for example, for newborn screening, um, then what else, what's unsolved about it? And what's, what's created the opportunity then for, for your work with Trace Matters? That, that's a great question. Like mass specs, usually you don't see many startups in mass spec space because usually um, they're like these big companies, Thermo Fisher and Agilent and Perkin Elmer and Waters, Brooker and Shimatsu. There's like five or s five to seven like big companies that and, and Syax, which all of them, they're public companies and the mass specs that they have. It, they ha they've been working on this for for decades, so it's it's like probably it's a good analogy to say that it's like a phone. Like Finnegan at Thermo probably in 90s, 60s, 70s started uh, the f made the first mass spec, and from there the new mass specs are just a uh, new generation which is built upon that that first mass spec. So it, it's really building a mass spec from scratch that can compete with these companies. It's it's almost, it's like uh, trying to move, move a mountain. Um, it certainly sounds tough, uh, <laughs> which is a great fit. But, but why, why go after this David and Goliath kind of um, situation? But again, there's lots of um, room for improvement in mass spec space okay, okay. because you can imagine like, again, I like to give this um, phone example. If you imagine when Apple started iPhone, um, uh, BlackBerry was a huge hit and everybody was using that. But <laughs> the problem is, is the, the architecture. BlackBerry couldn't just get rid of the keyboard and put a big screen. In order to just solve the, the problems which is in the DNA, you have to start from scratch. And if you don't start from scratch, then um, somebody else is going to do. Uh, so there's really, you can't go back in the, at, at the later stage of the stages of the development to, to change that. And for mass spec, you can imagine all these mass specs, they've, they've, the first generation was of 90s, 70s or 1960s, 1980s. So the components are still from back then. So even though um, there, there are many advances in technology, usually um, space is the same thing, like probably um, for us to say that, like if you have a working, if your system is complex and it's working, you don't change that. And that's why NASA is still using quads from 1960s because They've never failed. And it's kind of similar with the mass spec companies that um, they've kept the architecture the same. They're big, becoming bigger and bigger, more complex. But again, with, for example, with the new microcontrollers that we have today, just think can get very small, much smaller, much cheaper, simpler, and would deliver higher performance. Sure. So what's, I mean, I understand that there's an opportunity, right? Like you're you're looking at the shift in the iPhone and the mass spec that you can't get when you're locked in with a, you know, BlackBerry like architecture. But what is that that shift that you see? Is it 
Um, you're just making it smaller with better processors, or can you describe what what sets your product apart from what exists? In order, to, I think to answer that question, it would be nice if I tell you a little bit about the the history that how I got into this. Okay. In my in my PhD program, I, I, I was basically using a mass spec, and these commercial mass mm -hmm. specs they come like a box. You have only access to the inlet. So my, my uh, PhD dissertation was on plasma ionization sources, basically how to produce ions so that the mass spec can, can analyze that. So I got really interested to really move further to see what's happening to the ions after they, they get inside the mass spec. But again, these commercial instruments, they're just so complex that there's no way that you can open and, and modify a, a, mm -hmm. a, a component. So I said, you know what, I'll, I'll build my own mass spec. So I started building my own mass spec and I, I chose quad, quadrupole, which again, in the, Dr. Paul in 1989 um, got the Nobel Prize for that. And, so, and tell me how many years were the, what ago was this when you started building your first mass spec? It was 2015, almost um, um, probably five years ago now. Okay. Uh, but again, the, the theory is simple. So if I go back, probably I, I wouldn't dare to start building my own mass spec because in the books you read that, oh, it's so simple. There are four rods and you apply voltages, like these voltages to these four rods, and it acts like a filter. And you put a detector and there you go. You'll have your mass spec. Easy. <laughs> Easy peasy. It's like really the, the, the theory. It's like an... 10 minutes you can understand and it's it's super simple i, I was kind of naive and i'm like oh that's simple i i can make that so i started putting together mass spec and um oh man just the producing the voltages it took me three years to be able oh, wow. to produce a high voltage high frequency and highly accurate um mm -hmm. voltage and like even the making a quad like those four rods they need to be aligned to down to micron level. Otherwise, it's like oh. you're not going to get a good resolution. So um, in the process, I started spending like days and weeks on just playing with, with, with my, my, um, my prototype. And probably you've heard this, but there's a 10,000 hours rule that they say that if you if, you, if you're totally new to something, if you just spend 10,000 hours, you become an expert. If you want to play piano, if you want to dance, if you want to go mountain climbing, if you want to do anything, just spend the time, start from somewhere, and after 10,000 hours, you're, you're going to become an expert. And I that's, that's a lot of hours. <laughs> that's a lot of hours. That's, but again, it's, that's like five work years? <laughs> probably three, three and a half, yeah. But again, I, I, in my experience, it works because basically I, I'd never designed a mass spec. I, I had no idea what's inside just by reading and following and buying stuff on eBay and opening up and see how they made it. Um, I was able to make it um, work. So I, I was able to actually, you know what, let me show you the spectrum. That, that was a big achievement that I made. I still have that um, in my um, the favorite... Um, album of my my phone so so this is basically what 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 you're looking at okay that's so, the output right uh, that on the on the screen on the screen so this is yeah. the molecular mass and this is the intensity so okay, basically okay. seeing those sharp peaks it's like oh i'm able to separate separate my my ions when you saw that image that that particular image was the one that made you know that you finally got it to work I, I, I would never um, forget that feeling it's like you you've been trying to um, climb Mount Everest and you kind of you're you're tired but you you were able to get to get to the apex and and that's like really joyful but in the process you'd see many many um, points and areas of improvement in the design so when, you, when you're designing something, um, you're like, oh, for example, what if we do this? What if you, we do that? Um, so the, basically, my, my story in, the, in Trace Matters kind of evolved. And I was also, I was like, um, 
most of most of the funding from from trace and trace matters come from NASA. So at the, at the time, I was working on this project for um, plasma ionization for for basically Mars. And the, the idea was to make a ion source probe so that instead of scooping the soil and bringing the soil to the, to the rover mm -hmm. and doing the analysis so that you can put uh, really the ion source at the robotic arm uh, to be able to produce the ions and do the analysis. Mm -hmm. So I, I was able to make the ion source and that led to a bigger, bigger NASA project. But the question was that, okay, now that we, we build the ion source, the mass spec is on the body of the rover. Either you have to make it small and put the mass spec on the, body, the, the robotic arm, which is kind of not possible. It, it's difficult because you have to compromise yeah. the performance or you have to find a way to, to transfer the ions. And mm. then I was like, oh, so if we take this stacking ion guide and we make it flexible, then that would provide a lossless path for ions to reach the mass spec. And uh, from, from there, the, the, this, um, um, the, the idea of spy on started. And, and um, yeah, so that, that was kind of the, the story behind Awesome. So, yeah. So, like, so Trace Matters, it's, it's, I mean, it started, I wouldn't say it started, but part of its value proposition, let's say, is that it's about that you, you've nailed the way to do an ion guide so that it, it helps to, in some ways, sort of physically separate where the ion source is to the more traditional sort of mass spec instrumentation. That, that is correct. It's, it's kind of also one analogy can be, uh, optical fibers. So mm -hmm. we didn't have like there, there there's this analogy one to one analogy between mass specs and like optical setups. But for optical setups, we had uh, optical fibers that you can basically contain uh, photons in a flexible path to to deliver that from point A to point B. For mm -hmm. for ions, we didn't have any technology like that, and Spion fill, fills that gap. It's amazing. I think uh, I think now would be a good time to to watch that video, and you know, so people can see what you're what you're talking about. All right, let's just play it. What if you could advance your mass spectrometry capabilities? What if you were able to transfer protein ions from there a living is. tissue to a mass okay. spectrometer for in vivo analysis? To transfer ions from a distance to a mass spectrometer, there was no sensitive choice to turn to until now. Introducing Spion from Trace Matters. Spion is an ion transfer device that extends your reach. It can transfer ions for several meters. Spion is flexible. You can freely move it around. Spion is efficient. Its active ion transfer mechanism focuses ions on its central axis and allows for their high efficiency transfer. Be part of the flow, be part of the future, and imagine the possibilities. Is that like for, what, what, as a biologist, would I be doing that to help um, understand the, the chemistry that's on the surface of that, that living creature without harming it? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. Probably um, one very important application of this technology is in, in surgery, in cancer surgery. Um, and we, we have an uh, ongoing collaboration with um, Harvard Medical School uh, on that. And basically, one of the most important applications of um, mass spectrometer, like again, mass spec is, is a universal um, molecular profiling tool and like historically the way they examine tissue is they take biopsies they dye it like with different colors and the pathologist just looks it under microscopes and from from experience tells you okay this is cancer this is not and usually the process is, is very lengthy but but the process is gold standard and um my, my uh, collaborator, uh, Professor Natalie Agar at Harvard, she pioneered um, in using a mass spec like during surgery to aid the surgeon in removing the, the cancer's tumors. Oh, From, wow. Yeah, they, but basically they have, and um, uh, the, the, the surgery room is called Amigo. 
and um, they basically they have a mass spec in the surgery room and they they usually they, they've done multiple clinical studies that they basically um, uh, aid, aid the surgeon to analyze the tissue and tell um, the surgeon if it's cancer or not. Okay. So it's not like visibly, you know, it's it's hard to just see with your naked eye whether it's cancer or not. Oh, that's a very good point. Like probably for skin, it's visible. But this group is focused on um, brain cancer. Mm -hmm. For brain cancer, the tumor looks exactly, as far as I know, exactly like the brain. So the uh, surgeon uh, doesn't know if it's brain or if, it, uh, if it's, it's, it's the cancer tumor. And uh, the, usually the procedure is that prior to, to operation, they, um, they take a um, MRI from, from the head. And um, then um, they, they also, in this Amigo uh, surgery room, they, they, they have a um, MRI on the, on the rail on the ceiling that in the middle of the surgery, they can, they can bring it in. So usually the pro procedure is that they take an MRI, they kind of register the location of the, the brain. After they open the skull, they have to take another MRI because the brain expands. So again, they register the locations again. And the, the uh, surgeon basically with uh, help of MRI would uh, take off the tumor. But the problem is the margins because for brain, if it's like for breast or skin, um, it, it's it's easy to remove re remove extra tissue, but for brain you can't do that. And probably you've seen mm -hmm. uh, people going to like brain surgery. They they're usually they're they're conscious. Some of them play violin. They somehow keep them active to make sure that they're not damaging the brain. And mm -hmm. the problem is again is the margins that you can't cut extra. And if you leave the the tumor in the brain, it's gonna grow and it's gonna come back. Oh, yeah. So the process that they're using today at the um, at, at Amigo is that when the the surgeon when they get to the border, the surgeon starts slicing the brain and just hands some uh, request an immediate biopsy, which usually takes half an hour, and they're also they're doing clinical studies to to image the tissue with the help of a mass spec simultaneously. So with the help of Spion, we, we are hoping that we, um, we eliminate that step because usually this is an um, intrusive process, like you have to cut the tissue and then do the analysis. If it's healthy, you can't just put it back. Mm -hmm. So Spion is gonna help um, basically do the analysis before removing the tissue. And okay. that, that's very powerful. And um, again, it's, it's gonna be a long road, but you can have like immediate biopsy results and probably it's gonna be much, much more accurate than-, than So the, the surgeon can just grab your, you know, ion siphoning pen and just pop it right in their brain and take a little sample. Exactly. That's it. And you'll get immediate readings because the analysis time, it's less than a second. Like if you add- Oh, wow. That, uh -huh. um, like that- like uh, from the moment you produce your ion till the the mass spec gives a spectrum, it's it's almost it's in seconds time scale. So if you add the like algorithms for the processing the data, probably in less than five ten seconds, you can have immediate results. It looks like the motion activated lights in your your lab slash improvised studio have have gone off. Would would this be a time to do a show and tell at, at the lab bench, just at a distance, to so that. Um, the folks who are watching can see sort of that this is like a pen with an umbilical cord. Yeah. Do Do you want me to show show that? Well, I mean, if you could, if you uh, see, you slide the whiteboard. I don't, I don't know if you can show the secret prototype, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me show it that. hasn't been unveiled unveiled yet, but yeah, 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 so this, the, the, this is about like the the first prototypes, which basically, um, yeah, I've taken this apart, but this is um, um, basically the the flexible ion guy that um, the ion transfer efficiency is close to 100% that um, the ions enter from this portion and uh, would be introduced to, to the mass spec uh, on this portion. This portion, the end is gonna be connected to a mass spec. And this can be several meters long. And um, yeah, awesome. um, that, that was, um, yeah, we were, we were planning to, to test that. So I took it apart. Um, but basically, if you wanna, you want me to show you the actual tube, it's it's something like this. Okay. 
That's and awesome. Are you fabricating that like in the in the lab, like where where you are now? The, yes, the yes. The, the fabrication process was a complex process. I spent like almost two years to to perfect that. Um, um, and and is this this like you're building it like yourself, like just you, or do you have do you have a team working with you? I have a team, but usually um, if it's something challenging, I have to focus and solve that. And this is probably, I've made probably more than 10 different prototypes for, with 10 mm. different technologies to be able to make it manufacturable. So the way, so these these rings right now, they're, they're um, basically built with, with PCBs. So it's basically, uh, uh, I, I can grab a, a bare piece and, and show it to you. So it's basically, it is a, a 3D PCB structure like this that um, basically it's connected flexibly and there are capacitors so and resistors it, embedded in, in the structure. So for the one folks who can't see but are listening, uh, what we're seeing is it's kind of like a really swanky slinky, I guess, where, but it, what it does is it's able to, it's like a flexible um, hollow cord, right? And then, and, and that acts kind of like a fiber optic cable where we might use for like internet or data communications that it helps to guide the ions that are coming from the the probe end and guiding them through a flexible tube into the mass spectrometer that that's correct basically what what it's happening here is that uh as you can see um probably i can also show it here um that um so Basically, the structure is, is uh, made up of individual rings. So you can imagine like the first prototype that I made, probably I spent like two, three weeks just to make something this long. And um, it's just adding individual PCBs on top of each other and, and soldering everything under microscope. Um, basically, what, what, what's happening here, you apply two autophase RF voltages to odd and like every other ring. So for example, the odd ones, one RF, the even ones, the, the, the second autophase RF. And what happens then, um, uh, basically a, a, a potential well is created around the ring. So it, a channel is produced in the middle that contains forces the ions to the middle. And that's why the ions wouldn't hit the, the walls and get neutralized. So it's, it's kind of an active ion transfer because people have tried to just use bare tubing. And the problem with bare tubing is that when ion travel in, in bare tubing, um, uh, unlike uh, photons, which they travel in a straight line, ions diffuse. And if you have a plastic tubing, it's gonna sit on the tubing and it, we're gonna have charge buildup problem. And if it's metal, it's gonna get neutralized, but either way, it's, it's gonna get lost. But so with, with, with this structure, basically producing a channel for the ions to move losslessly to be able to reach the mass spec. And the speed of travel, it's, it's literally, it's, it's very fast. It's tens to hundreds of uh, meters per second. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Uh, was this a, uh, are, you, are you following a, a vision or say maybe more of a wandering path when you were, as, as a, a young student, you were, you were studying at, at Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, Iran, and then you Im immigrated into the United States, did uh, graduate studies and beyond, and you have such a deep understanding of um, of, of mass spectrometry and ionization. What has it been that's been kind of your guiding light to, to keep following this idea and, and going so deep on it? Well, that, that's a good question. Usually they say that like looking forward, you don't know what you're doing, but looking backward, the, the dot, dots get connected. Um, I probably, I liked chemistry. I, I see myself as a chemist, uh, but I my formal training, my bachelor's and PhDs in electrical en engineering. And I kind of switched bit back and forth between chemistry and electrical engineering. But looking back, uh, my first real project that I, I really loved to do was to build a pH meter when I was in elementary school. So it was really interesting for me how you can turn a, ke a chem 
chemical composition, a chemical property into an electrical signal that you, you can you can measure. Well, mm -hmm. uh, it was the, the making the membrane. I, I didn't recognize it. Never able. I was never able to make the pH meter. But it's it it was the the passion that I, I really tried to do that, and I have my own lab and everything. But again, it's it's just a, that passion to turning chemical property to, to electrical signals that looking back I, I can say that led me to to mass specs because down the road I noticed that the most complex probably system that I can work on is, is a mass spec and from there uh, basically mass spec field it's there's a like informal saying that if you try it once you're hooked to the end of your life and um, it's, it's really <laughs> famous it's something that's really addictive I don't know Wow. So, what it kids, is be why? careful if you're playing around with mass spec, right? You know? Yeah, because <laughs> you'll get it, addicted, <laughs> and then you'll start is, buying all these circuit boards. <laughs> yeah, it is really addictive, and probably the reason for that is that there's so many unsolved challenges that you just wanna, like, you can imagine yourself working for that. There's, I, I can't see an end to to the field of mass spectrometry. Like, probably like for for computers, you can. Like we have Moore's law that eventually we're going to limit. People are pushing that. But for mass spec, again, every day you find a new application. Every day you find a new technology. So also in mass spec, we have a, a, a Moore law, which basically they say every 20 year, uh, probably a, a new analyzer is, is going to be made. And usually those people get Nobel Prizes. Like the last one uh, was uh, Dr. Alexander Makarov who invented Orbitrap, which basically gives this enormous resolution that you can probably resolve mass of like one ten thousandth of a mass of a proton. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you so, got in, you got in for a Nobel Prize someday? Not really. I'm just... Um, yeah, no, I It'd think be pretty I, cool, right? <laughs> that would be. It would be cool, but again, um, I'm just a poor guy in the lab working my own stuff to to just enjoy the enjoy enjoy the science. But again, you never know. I, I just wanted to bring up your your story that was we talked about earlier. That was kind of funny. So, um, what really what really drove you to come study in the United States? It's yeah. Back then, I had no idea. But uh, again, it's it's the quality of higher education that probably in U.S. It's like um, these types of things you can't do in probably any other place on, on the planet. Like the, the most important thing is just these the infrastructure the infrastructure in the U.S. That from from the shipping companies to to suppliers, to, to all of them, they're really working hard for you to be able to achieve something. Again, like McMaster, DigiKey, FedEx, UPS, it's like all of these like together lets you just focus on what you're doing and not worry about anything. So usually whatever I, I order, I can have it on hand like the next morning at 10 a.m. And that's a luxury that I don't think you can find on any other place on the planet. I suppose that does speak to the idea of, of um, how best for building a scientific instrument or uh, and, and a company around it is how to do the rapid prototyping of this. And there may be uh, listeners who are, are thinking like, okay, well, where did you get this lab? How do you how does one build this kind of stuff and, and what kind of environment? So could you elaborate on, on where you're based right now, Maz? Yeah, Trace Matters is based in Green Town Labs. And again, one of the great things in being in the U.S. is being in, in Massachusetts, that you see so many like-minded people, many like state-run resources. And like, again, the ecosystem is just, it's something that the only limitation is your time, that you can, you can have access to everything. It's you're really always, you're short on time. And, um, Green Town Labs has been a, a like a, a really a game changer for us because here we have a machine shop. We have Steve, who is um, at physics department of uh, Harvard. He comes here to help us in, in machining. Um, basically, we have a CNC, we have three D printers, so we have all the resources, and then we, we can just go and focus on what 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 we're making. And that that is 
uh, something that I haven't seen anywhere else. That in Green Town Labs also you, you get your prototyping your own prototyping space that you can really start uh, doing like hardcore uh, prototyping. So one of the challenges that a lot of you know tough tech startups have is you know basically getting enough funding to you know, to create their idea and to get it into market before just running out of cash and going bankrupt or something. And I think it's interesting because it, it seems like you've kind of bootstrapped your whole operation. Can you talk more about, you know, your strategy that you've been taking for your company to get, get things to market? Yeah, that, that, that's a, a good question again, because um, probably um, it's funding these days, it's, it's not that easy. Well, there's um, good and bad to, to this because um, uh, there, there's lots of VC money available that you can you can just approach them and be able to raise money. But that on its own, it, it's a full time job. So if you want to do that, you can't focus on on the actually doing the work. So mostly I've, I've focused um, my efforts to uh, in working with NASA and fortunately with NASA and with like many, um, unlike many uh, government agencies, it's really, you need to know them and you need to know their needs and then you can really work with them. Unlike like NIH or NSF, NASA is an end user. So they need the technology. They, they just don't fund the um, like, uh, projects and and as a grant to for for public good um so that's why i decided to just focus my my efforts on uh, to uh, i'm working with nasa and uh, one reason for that is that they miss they probably make the best mass specs like if you buy a mass spec from thermo probably every month you have to call them for for service but in nasa they make mass specs they send it to space after like five years steal their they're getting data from that mass spec. So part of the um, the, the vision for, for Trace Matter is to learn from NASA to be able to commercialize those great technologies and also in the in the process um, make technologies for, for NASA to make it a, a mutual mutually beneficial relationship. But the funding situation again it's um, it's been tough and it's it's really um, just all these proposals with um, again the problem is that it really requires work you have to focus like two weeks three weeks up to two months on a proposal and the funding rate is like probably 10 percent 20 percent so you really really need to be kind of focus your efforts to make sure that you don't you don't waste any time which is your most valuable commodity are you seeing that that with d device and instrumentation, um, whether it's publicly funded, privately funded, that there's going to that there is a sh shift now as we've getting getting you know, more comfortable with um, digitization, autom autom automation, um, even Internet of Things. That these different kind of drivers are coming together to really transform the way that that we as as humans are building scientific instruments to make science go faster to make it more applicable for for the engineers who want to just just build stuff um, are you seeing some sort of shift because of that with trace matters being at the forefront for the mass spec I, I think so. It's been really slow. Like the, the change that you see in the world, it's in the scientific instrumentation, especially mass spectrometry. It's like you're just starting to see that. And it's it's really the momentum is not that great. So one of the areas that mass spectrometry has really exploded is in the, in the field of proteomics, which we, we're kind of also um, um, hoping to use spy on for that. And that is for the analysis of proteins. Uh, so that you can you can basically by studying the proteins you can you can tell like um, you, you can g gather valuable information and there has been a, a huge momentum for the for the machine learning and AI side because these are com really complex data that um, is being produced with mass spec but other than that that the the basically the hardware is not is not improving and the reason for that is because again it's not trivial to make a mass spec and usually if it's working just people just use that 
Sure. But the 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 momentum is is not created yet. But I think there's it's going to come to this fail at some point. So you're kind of using NASA to, I guess, back to the the path of your company. You're kind of using NASA to help fund your company and get you further along in ways that you know also grow your your commercial interests. What it, what do you view as your beachhead market? Like when this thing's ready and you start selling it, who are you going to sell it to? Is it the brain surgeons, or the, is that the first group? That, no, actually, I probably that's going to be the last group because like okay. probably you, yeah yeah. I, Probably can imagine that bringing a medical device, even like a simple, like really a simple thing, it takes years. So mm -hmm. uh, ba basically, our, our, our target is uh, at this point, it's like security market because, for example, probably you've seen at the airports, they use IM mobility. So the next generation is mass spectrometry. So that's one market. The other market is, is in food analysis and, and pharma companies that basically they need a point of, point of, um, point analysis and that's mm -hmm. where Spion is very powerful and hopefully uh, first we're, we're going to go in, in in those applications and then by maturing the technology eventually we're going to uh, build a very robust prototype for for the medical field how do you think about tech roadmaps in terms of like when when your your device supports so many different industries um, and and you, you acknowledge that like okay a medical device would to get it registered as a medical device would take a long time, but how do you how do you um, use the the stuff that you're learning from, say, working with NASA, to inform and improve the like spy on overall, so that it, it could you could go after food and medical down the road. Yeah, uh, I should also add that we also got into this Radix program for COVID uh, detection. And again, we partnered with Harvard and we submitted a proposal to this Radix program and we were not uh, selected for, for the, the one that's going to be deployed by the end of summer, but they gave, gave us a chance to prove the technology for uh, in a one year program. So you never know. It's like if you did help of Radix because of, because of the need, it might happen sooner. But um, yeah, it's... But the medical market is it's usually it's it's difficult because of all the standards and regulations and FDA and which is good, which is good because you don't want to just um, harm the patient and you want to make sure that everything is under control. So do you have any any advice for your uh, younger self, like maybe when you, you started dabbling with mass spec? Yeah, it, it was. Probably I was kind of young and naive that you think that ah oh, this is this is easy I can make it in a day and it's but looking back uh, with the difficulties that I've seen it's it's scary like having a startup in in how uh, probably uh, we call it tough tech so it's it's really tough it's it's not easy because the funding the technology everything is is working against you so you have to be really persistent and you have to really love what you're doing so usually i whenever i'm in the lab working on something i even i forget to eat and even like all of a sudden i'm like ah again it's eight at night and i haven't left so it's really you need to have that passion otherwise you're gonna quit you're gonna run out of um out of money your technology probably it's the chances that's not gonna work is much higher than you get it you get it to work because um, again, it's these are complex technologies that um, people like work on these at universities for decades to to find something new. So my, it's it's kind of it's um, it's the same as everyone says. It's um, that you need to really love what you're doing. If you don't love it, you're gonna quit because. Um, it's difficult. It's it's really it's it's difficult. It's not easy. But again, it's the the joy that you can you can get when when something is working. It's it's so much that it, you can just work for two years nonstop, and um, all of a sudden something is working, and you feel really really uh, good. And that's that's also another perk that probably you get um, working on a top tech. Yeah, that's that's pretty powerful.
Yeah, it is. And it's, it's a challenging and dare I say self-selected um, responsibility to be working at the, the frontier of science and engineering um, on, on the, the small but non-zero chance that it could work and it can really make a difference for, for the medical community, for space exploration and, and so many other fields uh, in between. Mas, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. No, thank you guys. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tough Tech Today. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast, please leave a five-star review. And if you enjoyed watching it on YouTube, please like and subscribe. In two weeks, we sit down with Caleb Carr of Vita Inclinata Technologies and discuss his load stabilization technology for helicopters and even cranes. Stay tough.